All right, so we're back on the follow-up, and this is the much-anticipated week of this series, God and Country, that we're talking about. It's really this idea of when should we be resisting authority as Christians. I don't know, hopefully it's not anticlimactic, like we didn't lead a march after after the sermon was over right. and, and have like a picketing. That took place. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So the question that I have to kind of like launch us into this discussion is like, what are the parameters? I know you guys covered this, but I think yeah. people are really interested in this because we're in a time in human history and our country and all these things where it feels like, you know, it would be easy to like jump on the resistance band bandwagon. So like, what are the actual parameters that you guys found in scripture for when a Christian should actually resist authority? Well, one of them was that we talked about whenever a government or authorities would infringe upon someone's faith. And so if a government authority in your life is telling you to believe something that's against what the, the, the Bible says, what your faith says, it's a pretty clear answer of when, when to resist that. That's when you should resist, critique, push back against any authority doing that. The second thing we said, talked about is when a government uh, abandons their responsibilities. Mm. The government is there for a purpose. God institutes governments and puts people in place and authority for purposes. And one of those is a c c to bring order. Mm -hmm. There's people who are, we need to order ourselves. Um, we also need to make sure there's justice that, are, that is brought forth as well. Um, and we want to value human life and just, there's a purpose of government that God institutes. And when they abandon that, then it's, uh, it's appropriate for us to resist to step into those those endeavors mm. yeah, and i think that there's um i think the added element of like there's the matters of like infringing upon your exercise of your faith and then like the abandoning the responsibility is also like okay well when do i step into some of these other spaces that are like secular spaces and go no 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 there's there's uh you're abandoning your responsibility to like protect those who are vulnerable Sure. And so I think that that's where, like, um, some of the examples I use were, you know, like the schools or, I mean, we talk about, like, abortion where, like, those are th those are populations where we feel like, hey, they can't necessarily speak for themselves. Sure. And so in order to, like, protect the greater good um, and these populations that we deem that God says is valuable, you know, protecting life, like, it means stepping into these spaces and, and actually engaging non-Christians, not just, not just Christians, um, in areas where we say, Hey, like this is, these are things that are valuable that, um, need to be upheld for those mm. who cannot sure. resist. They can't, they can't say, Hey, you're infringing upon my matter of faith. Like an unborn baby can't, uh, cannot step up, step up and do that. And to a certain extent, how able are children able to do that in school settings, you know, to, sure. with authorities and teachers and, um, or the elderly, you know, euthanasia on the back end, where it's like, hey, this person's maybe not even cognitively fully there. Like, who speaks for them and determines where life begins and ends? And so I think that there's there's that added element. And I think the, the biblical side of it was just being able to see, hey, there's even examples of that in Scripture. And that's where, um, I don't know if you... We, we talked about it, but the Hebrew midwives. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, too. yeah. Yeah. So that, I think yeah. that's, that's one of those yeah. fascinating ones in particular. That was a great example. I, <clears throat> that, that was really helpful for me to get clarity on that. I think some of the other, like, as you fast forward, the modern day examples were really interesting as well, where like William Wilberforce and the slave trade in, in England. Um, and just like how, again, that's a scenario in which there is a group of people who cannot speak for themselves. Sure. And so he was standing up, against the slave trade on their behalf. And so in some sense, there's a response, there's a Christian responsibility for those sorts of things. And God uses us to like kind of push forth his justice into the world that way. Um, so th those are, those are some really good examples. One of the things I also want to talk about alongside of that and just ask you guys what you think is um, when it comes to resistance, it's not just, do you resist or not resist? It's how you resist. And so what, what were some of the parameters or what, so, what are some of the parameters that people need to know as they think about resisting authority? Yeah, I, I think uh, <clears throat> just point wise with sermon, we were focused on, you know, what, how can we do it almost like within the system or as close to the system as possible in a way that like respects that like order is something that God values. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're not going in like, Hey, let's just destroy it all. 
Like, right. let's just complete anarchy. Like these things are broken. So let's just like get rid of it. And I think that a modern context would be like, Hey, let's defund the police. The right. police is corrupt. So the solution is just get rid of the whole thing. Right. It's like, well, what happens when, when that person needs help? Like, who are they calling? Like, are you yeah. calling your neighbor for help? Cause right now you're like, okay, get, get rid of those things. So when you call nine one one, what are you hoping is going to actually happen? That's not, it doesn't right. actually solve the issue. It just eradicates the whole situation. Right. So that in essence, that's an idea of like basically subverting the system and not just the authority, like not just, not just pushing it back against the authority in the means given to you, but trying to subvert the whole system. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's where sometimes you hear that. It's like, Oh, the system itself is corrupt. So get rid of the whole thing. It's like, Oh, I don't know that, that chaos. And I mean, that's, that's not something that we see uh, God even valuing. I mean, if anything, he is valuing order in all kinds of different ways, even with like how we order the worship service. Yeah. Like don't let that create, can become a chaotic environment. Like and we talks about speaking in tongues. I know it's not political, but it's like, don't let that space become so chaotic that like it's, there's no level of like the truth able to be spoken and people can't love each other well because it's just, there is no level of, of organization around it. And so God has been one of order from the very beginning to the end. And I think that there's, um, because he's the one who ordered it. Yep. He's the one who ordained those yeah. things. And so I think that was the, the first parameter. Um, and then if you want to talk about the, yeah, the second one we talked about was um, well, honoring God through the resistance. So when we, whatever we're doing, make sure we're honoring God. Mm -hmm. I guess we've seen this in a, maybe more recently. Just maybe if somebody has a good position, maybe that I agree with, whether it be spir spiritual or not. But the tactic they're using seems kind of like a middle school tactic, right? <laughs> where it's name calling or degrading people or dehumanizing people in the midst of that critique. And so you're wrestled with as a person of faith. I mean, I like this position. But man, the way they're going out doing this is not does not seem to be God like or Christ like the right. way they're doing that. And that that's a rough, rough thing for me to, to navigate. And and it's okay to actually critique, like to say, I like this position, but the way they're going about it, I don't like. I don't think that's Christ Christ honoring, and that's not something that we see biblically. We really want to approach this this resistance. Yeah. So we want to make sure in the end that God is glorified, that more people are brought closer to faith than mm -hmm. pushed away from faith that that matters in how we're resisting. Yeah. And so honoring God through our resistance matters. How, so how we're doing it matters just as much as the, the, the position we're trying to, right. to advance. Yeah. I want to dig down on that a little yeah. bit because I think people, um, I, I think you guys rightly called out that there's some, there's people on both ends of this spectrum, right? Yes. They're the people who are like, I don't want confrontation. I think Jesus, Jesus would have me just never do anything to resist. Yeah. And then you have the people on the other side who are like, I want to fight and I want to like go after and I want to do everything impossible to, to win. Right. Um, and so how we do it actually does matter. And I think one, one thing that I pulled out of both of yours is this idea that like how we talk about our authority actually matters. So, so tell me what you think about um, like as a Christian, when you're resisting authority, what should our disposition, what are, what should our words look like towards an authority? This is, I guess, a, a, a tough one. Maybe, maybe that's much tough. I think we need to be honoring. We need to be praying for our authorities. We need to be yeah. honoring. So we don't have to agree with them. We can call them when they mess up. They call them out on the things that they're wrong. And we can be bold about that. And we should be. But we should be respectful in the nature that we that we do that. The thing I think was hard um, and this is an example of honoring God over men, is that unfortunately, I think in our political system we have now, uh, negative campaigning works. Yes. And so to be effective, to get votes out, to get your base out, to, to maybe get that, that, to get your party into power that you want in power, mm -hmm. being nasty, calling, pe uh, calling people names, dehumanizing them, lying about, about things, right. uh, skirting the truth, shaping things in a certain way, makes your your party like they really aren't truthful that unfortunately works in this world mm -hmm. politically. Yeah. But we are not of this world. Mm -hmm. We are part of the kingdom of God. And so we're called to a higher standard. So this is an example that I think for Christ followers, we may need to operate in a way that may not be as effective politically in this world, but honors God. And ultimately my allegiance is to God and making sure that he is pleased with me. Not that 
I, I my my the people who share my political views are the ones that are pleased with me. Right. And that's why I think it's hard. I actually admire Christ followers who go into politics. Mm-hmm. That's a hard endeavor to be to keep your faith strong and to be right. above reproach in those environments. Not that everyone's perfect in that regard, but that's a hard endeavor because the incentives are to be unchristlike in the in endeavors and the, in the tactics they use to get their political means. So it's it's hard, but from our Christ follower standpoint, we're here to honor God before men. So yep. I want to make sure if that means I'm going to lose this battle politically, but I'm yep. honoring God, I'm taking that every time. And that's what we're called to mm-hmm. scripturally. And I think right mm-hmm. now, to your point, I think right now one of the biggest challenges for the church in this series is how we talk about leaders. Because yep. I think it's really easy to jump on kind of the political rhetoric out there on sure, one side or the sure. other and to like make fun of the president or make fun of a former president or to like categorize people as the media has categorized people or their opponents have categorized people. And, um, you know, it's like, I think people are always walking that line. Some people don't care at all, sure, but I think sure. people are always walking that line where like, well, in private, I really make fun of X, Y, and Z and just really hammer them sure. in every way that I can you know, and then like, but publicly I don't do that. So I'm okay. Right. And it's like, actually what we say is a reflection of what's in our heart. Right. And so we can disagree with a leader and we could adamantly disagree. We could passionately disagree. We could Mm -hmm. say the truth about what we know. Right. Their position is immoral and you could still do that in a respectful way. Right. But yeah, but how you are speaking about an authority reflects in your heart, whether or not you're honoring them. And so I think that's like, as I listened to the message, I was like, this is the hard one for people, especially in our political climate, how you talk about and how you think about the authorities that are in our lives actually matters. And so I think God would challenge us on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, And I think that there's, um, that's where I'm interested in some of the biblical examples where we see, um, because I don't think we really got into the prophet's, of Israel criticizing Israelite kings who are, you know, they're in the covenant with the Lord. But where we see situations like Esther was the one of the ones I used in the sermon of like her approaching with respect and deference to the authority there where she knows she's pushing a boundary, but she's not doing it. Like she didn't bring the whole nation of Israel into the throne room and be like, we demand that you recognize that you're doing something wrong. No, like she like humbly comes up and knows I may die for doing this right now. And right. I'm going to invite you to come and like actually break bread with me. And mm-hmm. we're going to have, we're going to talk over this over a meal. It's like, man, what a different posture. Yep. And even another one that I had, I was just thinking about as you guys were talking was Nehemiah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the book starts out. I mean, he's a cupbearer to the King. Like he know he's like, Oh man, like I, I feel this burden of the Holy spirit to like make this request of like, I want to go back and rebuild. I've heard that Jerusalem is, you know, it's in shambles and the, t- the temple's been torn down. Like I feel a holy calling to go and do that. And so he's, there's, there's prayer and fasting and he knows, oh man, I'm going into this and I want to show respect and honor and entreat and not be like, Hey, this is an injustice and you need to do something about it. Right. You should, you know, like there's, I don't know, there's a humility there, I yep. think. Yeah. And I thought, I thought the other good example that was brought up was Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Where like, if you read his speeches, you go, whoa, they're hard hitting. Mm -hmm. They are uh, incredibly well um, put together rhetorically to like make a point. But also he was, he was committed to peaceful resistance, you know, and he was committed to not maligning people with, with his words. He did it in a way that pointed out the truth. And sometimes the truth is really hard, Sure, but he did it in a way that was respect, respectful, you know? And so it's just an interesting kind of like line to balance and you can't really basically like just give blanket statements on everything. It's like how you apply this in specific situations. But that's kind of the next thing that I want to talk about, which is can we think of like modern day examples that people are facing maybe right now, maybe not politically or maybe politically, but like in their workplace or at school or in their family even, you know, like it, are there things that there's authority figures that we have to resist and what do those look like? And, you know, kind of what would we say to those people? Yeah. I was I sure. So I shared with you earlier that a friend who doesn't go to our church, but a friend of mine who was in a corporate environment and worked his life in corporate America. Um, and he just recently retired. He retired earlier than he really wanted to. He just kind of stepped down earlier than he wanted to. 
and asking him about why that is. And ultimately a lot of it was, um, there was just, there's pressure within his workplace for him to adopt ideologies, to adopt beliefs. Prim- they were against his faith, primarily towards transgenderism, towards uh, homosexuality, all those different things like that were, where I think he, he just did, did, didn't line up with his faith. And so here's a guy who's worked in a company and worked alongside people who had different beliefs of his, but when it moved into advocacy where they were expecting him to be an advocate mm-hmm. and jumping on board with that, that was too far for him. And so, which I really admire him. I think that's a good example of, uh, it's one thing to, we're in, we're in a culture that doesn't, that's not all Jesus following and don't all follow God. And so we should expect the fact that people who are in our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools only believe the same things we believe. But when it goes into advocacy and you have to, you have to adopt these beliefs that are counter to the biblical belief, that's a spot to push back and say, I can't, I can't do that. It's too far for me to, to go to lie in the sand. I'm, I'm, I can't go beyond that. And I think there's protections legally within our country for those types of things. Not that they're always are upheld. There's consequences that are probably going to happen minimally, maybe socially mm-hmm. um, as well, but even employment wise, that I think is an example of probably more a, a prominent example um, for what people are facing today uh, when they're in their workplaces. Right. And yeah. so you might say to a Christian, like, in those scenarios, you should follow the values that, you know, God's word has put forth mm-hmm. in your conscience, but also know that you might suffer for that. And I think when I think about politically, maybe we're in a time of religious freedom sure. in our nation, but like, I think we're we're quickly approaching a scenario in which Christians increasingly are going to feel the pressure and the consequences of, of actually resisting authority in those ways. You know, like they, you know, it's kind of like, uh, if you're in a workplace and um, everyone needs to fly the pride flag in their cubicle because that's what the company is doing this month um, and you decide not to, maybe maybe you don't have any like um, real like workplace repercussions formally, but that does change the opinion of the people you're working with. Sure. Or it might change your boss's opinion if they're very sure. adamant and passionate about that that issue. And so like maybe not anything written down, but like just in terms of like when a promotion comes up, what does your supervisor think of you yeah. when you're considered for that? And I think people will face that and do face that. Sure. Jeff, did you have any other examples? Yeah. I mean, I guess in this, in the realm of uh, counseling. Um, so I was just thinking we've, we've seen this rise in news when it comes to photographers and cake makers and website right. developers yeah, where it's absolutely. like, Hey, if yeah. you're, developing and you don't want to be a part of like a same-sex wedding ceremony then you know people are ending up in lawsuits it's rising to the supreme court but in the counseling space there's also and this is where language is really important um because i think we'll, we'll throw terms out without really defining what we mean by that so you know one right now is christian nationalists Let me label someone a christian nationalist and you can mean whatever you want by that but it's like right. oh i'm going to discredit you by just calling you that yep sure but on the other side like for the counseling realm uh Conversion therapy mm-hmm. is, is an area where it's like, essentially, if you do anything in the realm of like counseling someone who has unwanted like same sex attraction, mm-hmm. you're uh, you can be labeled a conversion therapist, which which can be the worst possible situation where kids were starved and there were right. there were a number of like abuses that took place. Where it's like that doesn't necessarily describe the person who's saying, hey, I've got an individual who doesn't want to desire the same sex and wants to know what does it look like to live a pure life? Either mm-hmm. maybe it, it, it is healing in the sense of I'm not going to I'm going to live a celibate lifestyle or um, I'm going to adopt a holy Christian sexual ethic. And maybe that turns heterosexual. Maybe that in, maybe I get married right. and have, you know, a traditional marriage at some point where it is a man and a woman being married. Um, but but because that label of conversion therapy and that's what's being thrown around legally all these it's like no no no. if you're in california for example you know and you put that label on somebody it's like oh and you are evil like you are right. you're in a category of like now you can be prosecuted now mm-hmm. you're not keeping up with your you're a licensed counselor you're supposed to be abiding by these things and it's like that may not be at all the tone right. of what's taking place and so essentially what's happening for christian and biblical counselors is they're like okay either i don't engage these, like either I act like I'm not an expert in these areas. And so I Mm -hmm. refer out if a same sex couple comes to me or 
or I'm, I'm going to have that conversation and mm -hmm. open myself up for possible litigation. I could lose my license. Mm -hmm. And, and so people who are interacting with the government where they're, Hey, I'm a licensed counselor. I answer to the state are having to navigate of like, how biblical can I be? Right. You know, am I going to do it subversively? Am I going to, am I going to abide by the rules exactly conscience wise? Yeah. And so that's, that's one of those. Wow. Um, that is, that is a really tough one. And I've heard two things to that one. I've heard that some of the fines in certain states are astronomical. So like, you know, it's like if you keep doing this sort of practice or you've done this sort of practice, you know, it's like a hundred thousand dollar fine or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just, so it's like the average counselor can't abide that, you know, so mm -hmm. it automatically and to fight it in court also costs money. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then additional to that is there are advocacy groups that are going out and trying to, trying to like kind of farm those situations. So mm -hmm. they purposely sign up for Christian counseling and then go after Christians that way. Yeah. So I think, I think what I'm trying to get at is I think we live in a world where it's clear that Christians will face this to some degree sure. or another. And it might not be a giant political plant battle that goes to the Supreme court. But I think that in a real world scenario, there are areas where we'll have to resist and experience the consequences for it. And I think our call is to remain faithful to Jesus and to resist in the mode, in the scenario, in the way that we're supposed to, and to use the processes in place to resist peacefully. Um, so yeah, awesome discussion, guys, today. That's It was amazing. I love, I wish we could keep talking, but you know, people have things to do. So, um, but yeah, so thank you so much for uh, joining um, the follow-up this week. If you haven't yet already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That helps us. If you could leave a comment below, we'd love to get the conversation going and share, share what's been valuable to you that, for that. Um, and then also uh, share this with somebody else. I mean, we're talking about real world things uh, that people love to hear about. And so share this conversation with someone else. Thanks. Thanks.